Okay, so I asked you to write down the primary role that sun plays, sunlight plays, and I think you guys have a pretty good idea after yesterday in living systems, and to define photosynthesis. And if you need to hit enter, go ahead and hit enter if you want your answer in there. Oh, destroy it? it shouldn't. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to lock you out, and we'll just talk about it. How about that? So it looks like energy plants use sunlight to produce CO2 carbohydrates, or carbohydrates, sorry, and oxygen. That works. Heterotrophs keep everything alive by making energy. Plants, algae, and some bacteria use sunlight to produce carbohydrates and oxygen. Yep, for sure. Lots of good answers conceptually. I think you guys understand what we're talking about when we say photosynthesis and sunlight making energy from CO2 in the air. But now let's talk about the chemistry behind it. That's kind of what we're here to do today. So we're going to look at the role of pigments in photosynthesis, what pigments do. We're going to look at the roles of the electron transport chain, the ETC, and how that helps us make ATP and NADPH. And we'll talk about how plants make sugar because they do that actually without light. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the three factors that can affect photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is that process that provides energy for almost all life. Now chloroplasts are the organelles that convert light energy into chemical energy. So we know inside of plant cells they have those very special organelles that collect light and make uh, C6H12O6 glucose called chloroplast. Now, really it's not the chloroplast that's doing all of the business. It's actually these little flattened sacs inside of them called thylakoid membranes. And they're inside of this fluid called stroma inside of the chloroplast, right? So this membrane produces flat disc-like uh, sacs called thylakoids that are arranged in stacks that contain molecules and absorb light energy for photosynthesis. So they actually kind of look like little stacks of pancakes inside of the chloroplast. And we drew them out kind of rough drawings yesterday. But they look like this. If you take a look at the picture in front of you, you have a plant cell. And then you have inside a plant cell that chloroplast, which is a double membrane structure. And then you have more membrane structures, and you have stacks of them. And they're called thylakoids. And one stack of thylakoids is called a grana. Everybody say grana. Many, all of your thylakoid stacks together are called granum. Everybody say granum. Granum. So a chloroplast has many stacks of thylakoids, each one called a grana. Together they make up granum. And they're all inside of this fluid called stroma. Everybody say stroma. Stroma. So light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, energy that can travel through empty space in the form of waves. OK, that makes sense. So sunlight contains all of the wavelengths of visible light, which we see as different colors. Oh, goodness, we're going to have to talk about that now, aren't we? I cannot imagine talking about this without talking about the visible light spectrum. This looks familiar, right? There's a range here. It goes from 400 to 700. Oops, that's not 700. 700 nanometers. Oh, come on now. My pen's getting away from me. There we go. So this is the range of wavelengths of which we can see. So over here we have these really big wavelengths, and then they start to get smaller and more intense. Okay, uh, it's kind of a bad drawing, but I think you understand, right? If I'm looking at these, is red or violet more intense or powerful? What do you guys think? Just yell it out because I don't have Pear Deck available right now. You think red's more powerful? Let's think about it for a minute. Look at the eraser end of your pencil or pen. Would you rather be stabbed by that end or the pointy end? 
probably the eraser end, right? This doesn't hurt. This might hurt a little, right? Okay. So it's like which end of the knife would you want to be poked with, right? The, the handle end. And it, if you think about it, it makes sense because it's bigger, right? It's not as powerful. Short wavelengths are way more powerful. Knowing that, what color are plants in the summer? Everybody say green. Green, okay. So what you're saying in the summer, plants are green. They're reflecting green. Could they also be reflecting yellow, orange, and red at the same time? How come we see green and not red, orange, and yellow in the summer? Green is more intense, right? It's more powerful. So green overpowers red, orange, and yellow. So they're there all along. But when chlorophyll goes away in the fall, and plants are no longer have the pigment chlorophyll green to reflect green light, what do we start to see? Red, orange, and yellow, which have been there all along, but now are visible. Okay? I just want you to think about plants, how they need some wavelengths, and they don't need others. Now, a pigment is a substance that absorbs certain wavelengths or colors of light and reflects all of the others. Now, in plants, light energy is harvested by pigments that are located in the thylakoid membrane of chloroplasts. Let me ask you this silly question. What is the one color that plants do not need? What's a color that plants just don't need? Certain wavelengths. Violet, black, purple, blue. One person got it. Green, right? That's why they're reflecting it. Think about it. It's really weird. The color you associate the most with plants, they actually don't want. They want blue and red, mostly. Brown is a combination. That's not a color. It's not. No. Uh -uh. You're seeing a bunch of different colors. So chlorophyll is a green pigment in chloroplast that absorbs light energy to start photosynthesis. It is synthesis. Bleh, synthesis. My tongue's not working. Now it absorbs mostly blue and red light, and it actually reflects green and yellow light. So really, plants don't want green. They also don't want yellow. Now this makes plants appear green. Now, plants also have pigments called carotenoids. What's that word look like? Reminds me of carrot. And in fact, some carotenoids are red and orange. So these help plants absorb more en light energy. It's additional energy. Now, when light hits a thylakoid, energy, bless you, is absorbed by many pigment molecules, and it eventually is transferred into electron carriers. We'll talk more about those in a minute. I want everybody to just look around the room real quick. And I want you to realize that everything in this room probably doesn't really have a color, right? I mean, it's just reflecting wavelengths of light that are bouncing off it. And so what are things really? That's really what, you know, if you look at the wall, if you look at the blue cupboard over there, the only reason that's blue is it's absorbing some colors, but other ones are bouncing off of it. And it really makes you think of what color actually is. I mean, it all depends on what species of animal you are, too, right? I mean, we could be a lot, we could look at something as a dog or as a human and see different things. Or what? It is. It may, don't think about it too long. It starts to mess with you. So electrons from the electron carrier are used to produce new molecules, including ATP. And these temporarily are able to store chemical energy. Now, during photosynthesis, one electron transport chain provides energy to make ATP and the other to make NADPH. And both chains are used from electrons excited by light. You guys ready for the fun stuff? Okay, here we go. So. How does this whole thing start? How does photosynthesis begin? It starts with light, obviously, the sun. Everybody stand up real quick. Stand up, stand up. We need to... What? It does, anatomy. We're standing up. You got your skeletal system, you got your muscular system. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, everything is. I'm glad you said that because it's really the only thing that matters is science, right? No. No. So take a look at your computer up here. I'm just going to consensually talk about this because I didn't want you to go to sleep because we're going to be taking quite a bit of notes here today. So light travels down to planet Earth. I think we understand that. You know, we're it's cold today, but it's not like super, it's not Antarctic cold, okay? It's not like Uranus cold, right? So light travels down and hits a bundle of pigments on one of those thylakoid membranes we talked about inside of the chloroplast. It excites these pigments. Light can excite you, right? You ever like have your mom turn on the lights in the morning and you go, ah. But it, it stimulates you, right? It wakes you up. You're like, oh, and you have a reaction, right? Everybody say, everybody say right. Everybody say right. We're going to interact today, I promise. Okay. So light hits a bundle of pigments, and the pigments actually activate this little enzyme underneath them, and this enzyme splits water. And it splits two water molecules into oxygen. Can oxygen leave the membrane? Everybody say yes. Why? Because it's small enough and does not have a charge. Okay. Hydrogen is small enough, but it has a charge. And it's a good thing because this starts to accumulate inside of the thylakoid membrane. So we start to get a concentration gradient. Everybody say concentration gradient. Oh, man, you guys are tired. Concentration gradient. Concentration gradient of hydrogen. And that's good because we need to run that enzyme. Can anybody remember what the enzyme's name is? ATP synthase. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a minute. The other thing that happens is this electron transport chain gets excited as well. Everybody have a seat. Nope. So electrons excited by light leave the chlorophyll molecules, and an enzyme splits the water molecule to replace these electrons, and oxygen gas is formed and then released into the atmosphere. So again, light comes down, and it hits the thylakoid membrane. Not just the phospholipid bilayer, but these bundles of pigments. These are called photosystems. Everybody say photosystem. There are two photosystems in photosynthesis. This is one of them. Okay? Light hits the photosystem, bundle of pigments, and excites the pigments, which in turn excites the enzyme that splits water, creating oxygen and hydrogen ions. Oxygen can freely diffuse out of the plants. This is why plants give us oxygen. This is where this is happening at, splitting water. It's kind of weird. All of our oxygen comes from water. Okay? So water gets split. Oxygen leaves the plant, and we get oxygen, but hydrogen is trapped in because it has a charge. Also, the electron transport chain is fired. It's like the wave. Have you guys ever start a wave at a football game? Bless you. You guys are not even. Let's do the wave. You guys, you start. Ready? Yep. We start here. You guys go here. I'll start. Yeah, go around your room. Oh, man. I'm gonna, we'll see if we can even make it. See, they teetered off right back there, right? So it slowed down. We'll talk about that later. Man, you guys are not happy campers. Something happened. Somebody. Okay, who is? Why? Why? What happened? What'd you do? All right. How about the next thing that happens? So, you guys, we split water. Great. We get hydrogen building up inside. Great. Oxygen leaves. Awesome. I can breathe. The next thing that happens I talked about was that firing of the electron transport chain, which allows us to activate a pump. Do pumps take energy? Yes. So the first part of that electron transport chain activates a hydrogen pump. It pumps more hydrogen into the cell, which, give, which gives us an even higher concentration gradient, right? Okay. So what's our whole goal here for this first part? To increase our concentration gradient of hydrogen inside of the thylakoid membrane, okay? So those hydrogen ions into the thylakoid in this process creates a concentration gradient across that membrane. Good. So the, this. This is a protein inside of the thylakoid membrane, which is also a pump.
Well, it is. It's a type of phospholipid layer. Yes. Okay. Yep. So we build up that concentration gradient of hydrogen so that we can run the ATP synthase pump or enzyme. Yes. So remember yesterday we talked about this guy? The whole goal of that first photosystem is to increase the hydrogen concentration gradient so that we can activate ATP synthase so we can make ATP. That's the first product of photosynthesis, ATP. Yep. Yep, exactly. Is there any questions on this? Yes. A little bit. Like the chloroplast and the cell membrane and the cell wall, a little bit. That's why there's stacks of them, so even the other one will collect it. So the other thing that we have to make is NADPH, our hydrogen carrier. So we're not done yet. You notice how I, I tried to do a wave and we made it like halfway through the room and things slowed down? So what you're saying is light will wear out. So as I use that light energy to pump hydrogen in over here, it's going to start to teeter off. So that means I'm going to have to collect more what? Light energy, right? So there's a second photosystem. So there's two photosystems. And the next one is going to collect more light to re-energize the electron transport chain so we can make NADPH. So light excites electrons in another chlorophyll molecule, and those electrons are passed on to the second chain and replaced by the de-energized electrons from the first chain. So if we got to there and the wave needed to be restarted, you guys would have to be like, all right, we're going to start the wave, stand up, collect more energy, and off we would go around the room. It's kind of like at a football game. You start at one student section on one side, right? They're all excited. Woo, they do the wave. And then they get to the old people over here like me. We've got our kids, and we're, like, trying to take care of them, watch the game. And they don't stand up and do the wave, and it teeters off. By the time it gets to the next one, the next student has to have all that energy, and then they start it again, and it goes around the stadium, right? It's kind of like that. You've got two different photosystems. So why have a second photosystem? We have to have a hydrogen on an NADP plus to make NADPH our hydrogen carrier. So excited electrons combine with hydrogen ions and NAD plus to form NADPH. And remember, NADPH, nicotinamine diphosphorylate, is an electron carrier that provides high energy electrons needed to store energy in organic molecules. Why would I need to store all of this light energy? Why would I need to store all of this light energy? Amp answer this simply. The simplest answer you can give me. Why would I need to store all of that energy in the light? Have I talked about removing CO2 yet or making glucose? I haven't mentioned it yet today, have I? Everything I've talked about does require light, right? Two photosystems. Why, why would I need to store energy when it's light? Short answer is it's not always, it's not always light available, right? Okay. So some things require light, some things don't. It's not that you need light for the other reactions, but those reactions I just talked about require light. What? I can't hear you. What? No, speak up, please. I got this thing in my ear. What? Yes, sir. Yep, this will not happen without light, everything on this screen. We're going to talk about that. Yep. So these are what are known as the light-dependent reactions, also known as just the light reactions, right? Okay? So stand up, please. Ali Boo. Stand up. Says I want you to get where you can see the front. We're going to talk about all these fun reactions together. So there are two places we collect light. This top portion is called the electron transport chain. Okay, light hits the first photosystem bundle of pigments to do two things. Activate an enzyme to split water into oxygen, which is released by the plant, and hydrogen ions, which start to build up inside of the thylakoid membrane. Okay, the other thing that happens is we 
fire the electron transport chain to activate a hydrogen pump to get more hydrogens inside of the thylakoid membrane so that we can drive ATP synthase to make ATP. First photosystem, first, first photosystem makes ATP. We good there? All of this happens to make ATP. The second photosystem recharges the electron transport chain so that we can add a hydrogen on NADP plus to give us NADPH. So this is the second product. ATP and NADPH are our two end goals of the light reactions of photosynthesis. Everybody say light dependent. Light dependent. Our light reactions. OK, they require two photosystems, photosystem one and two. What? First one splits water with an enzyme and activates the electron transport chain to pump hydrogen in. And that forces ATP synthase to make ATP by hydrogens going through the enzyme. Okay? The second thing that happens is the second photosystem is fired, recharges the electron transport chain to add enough hydrogen on to NADP plus to give us NADPH. We good there? That's half of photosynthesis. Have a seat. The second half happens when it, well, it doesn't have to be dark. They call them the dark reactions, but they don't require light. These will still happen during the day. They just don't need light to happen. Yeah, they can. So the first two stages of photosynthesis depend directly on light <coughs> because light energy is used to make ATP and NADPH. In the final stages of photosynthesis, the ATP and NADPH are used to produce energy storing sugar molecules from the carbon in carbon dioxide. So it's the dark reactions where we remove CO2 from the atmosphere and put it in sugar. So that doesn't take light. Well, it does indirectly, but not directly. So the use of CO2 to make organic compounds is what is called carbon dioxide fixation, also known as carbon fixation. How do you know when carbon's broke? When you have to fix it, yeah. Reactions that fix carbon dioxide are light independent reactions, meaning they don't need light. So we, they're often referred to as the dark reactions, but they don't just happen in the dark. Now, the most common method of the carbon uh, fixation is called the Kelvin cycle, named after a child who had a very mean parent because they called him Melvin Kelvin. That's his real name. It'd be like me having a boy and calling him Jason Mason. That's silly, isn't it? One of my daughters? I know. If I had a boy, it was going to be Max. Max. Kind of a dog's name, though, I think. So atmospheric CO2 is combined with other CO2, uh, carbon compounds to produce organic compounds. ATP and NADH supply the energy that is required to force those reactions. Now, here's the thing. We collect all that energy from the light, right? Because we need to use it in the next cycle that we're going to talk about to make sugar, glucose. Now, don't get caught up in all this craziness. I don't want anybody to freak out and go, oh my gosh, I better remember all that. I can't remember all that. You don't have to. You have to conceptually retain this knowledge. So everybody take a look up at the front and follow with me for a moment. Just pause what you're doing. So the cycle starts right here. How many carbons are here? Five. This is a single five carbon molecule. I will tell you, you have to go through the Kelvin cycle twice to make one glucose molecule. So we start with five carbons. Then we take CO2 in from the air one at a time. What happens when I add a CO2 to this five carbon molecule? I get a six carbon molecule, right? And then as I take it in, I split it into two different three carbon molecules. Don't worry about their name. I don't even care about that right now. Okay? So I need to somehow take that CO2 that I just added to that six carbon molecule and split it into two three carbon molecules 
into a form where I can remove two, each one for each time around, to make glucose, C6H12O6. Carbon, or glucose, has how many carbons in it? C6, right? Okay. So I need to remove two of these, but I first have to change its form. If I'm going to break bonds and reform bonds, does that take energy? Everybody say yes. Yes, right? Okay. So I use ATP energy and NADPH energy. Where did this energy come from? Say so the, the light dependent reactions, right? The light reactions of photosynthesis that we made back in the electron transport chains. Okay? So we use energy that was stored in ATP and NADPH to convert it into a removable form, another three carbon molecule, very similar but different because I can now remove two of them, one for each time through the carbon Kelvin cycle to make glucose, okay? Well, that's great. I accomplished my mission. I took mission. I turned CO2 into glucose. Do I have to reset the cycle? I do. Like if I was just trying to end it and be done with it and it was linear, I could be done here. But I need to revert it back to that five carbon molecule because I removed one of those three carbons. So that's going to take more ATP to revert it back to that five carbon structure so I can start this whole Kelvin cycle again. That's a lot, right? What should you be focused on? The fact that I'm removing CO2 from the air and adding it to an existing five carbon molecule, that I'm changing that structure with energy, ATP and NADPH, so that I can remove one three carbon molecule each time through the Kelvin cycle, and that it takes two times through the Kelvin cycle to get one glucose molecule. How do I know this is glucose? One, two, three, four, five, six, C6, H12O6. Okay? Then I need to restart the whole thing, so I have to use ATP to break and form new bonds to get it back to that original five carbon molecule. Then we can do it again. We good? This is why no one likes photosynthesis. It sounds fun, right? Like when you're a kid, they're like, oh, it's how you make sugar from sun. And then you go, yeah, but you haven't talked about the photosystems and the electron transport chains and Mr. Dr. Kelvin, Mel Melvin Kelvin, and oh, I know. It's even worse in college. They make you memorize all the names of like RUBP and oh. All right, we'll come back to that later, don't worry. So light intensity, CO2 concentration, and temperature are three environmental factors that do affect photosynthesis. Although different plants are adapted to different levels of light, the photosynthesis rate increases with increases in light intensity until all of the pigments in the chloroplast are being used. At a certain point, you will have all pigments firing. At that point, you cannot go through this process any faster, and you can get all the light intensity and all the CO2 in the world, and it's not going to make it go any faster. The only problem is if you get too much temperature, what could happen? You could overheat, right? You could actually destroy your proteins, and since proteins are running this whole thing, that's not good. It's like cooking an egg, right? It doesn't work as a chick anymore, right, or an embryo. So photosynthesis is most efficient in a range of temperatures. There's a sweet spot. And it is different for different plants. So a summary, and I will review again, and then let you go. In plants, light energy is harvested by pigments located on those thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. During photosynthesis, one electron transport chain provides energy used to make ATP, while the other provides energy to make NADPH. Two different pigments firing for two very different reasons, one to make ATP, one to make NADPH. In the final stage of photosynthesis, those dark, light, independent reactions, the Kelvin cycle, chemical energy is stored by being uh, used to produce sugar molecules from CO2 in, in the air into our glucose C6H12O6 molecule using the ATP and the NADPH from our light reactions or our light dependent reactions. And then light intensity, CO2 concentration, and temperature are three environmental factors that affect photosynthesis temperature being the one that you can't have too much of or it could stop the whole process, okay? Now, let's jump back here. 
Let's just talk generally about what's going on. Look, you can look at the board and follow my cursor if you want. Light comes down, passes through a leaf tissue, of plant, passes through a cell wall, it passes through a cell membrane of a plant cell, it passes through the chloroplast outer membrane, through the stroma, and then hits another membrane called a thylakoid. Remember, there's stacks of thylakoids, stacks of these structures right here, okay, like stacks of pancakes inside of the chloroplast, each one connected. One stack of thylakoids is called a grana, all of them together granum inside of that fluidy stroma. That light hits the pigments, the first photosystem, exciting an enzyme which splits water into oxygen and hydrogen ions. The oxygen is, does not have a charge, but is very small, so it can leave. This is why plants make oxygen. Okay? The hydrogen ions are trapped inside, and that's good. We want that. It creates a concentration gradient inside of the thylakoid. It also fires the first electron transport chain, which drives the hydrogen pump to pump more hydrogen into the thylakoid membrane. So these thylakoids are collecting hydrogen. Why? They want to drive ATP synthase, where you add a phosphorus on an ADP to make ATP. This only happens if you have a concentration gradient of hydrogen. That's, for, that's the first photosystem. The second photosystem happens when that ETC starts to wear out, and another bundle of pigments, another photosystem, collect more light to recharge the electron transport chain, to add a hydrogen on an NADP plus, to get NADPH, our second high energy product of the light dependent light reactions of photosynthesis. That's the light. That's what requires light, right? Why are we making NADH during the day or when light's out or just from light? Because we need energy to go through the process of carbon fixation, fixation removing CO2 and putting it in glucose molecules. What does that look like? We take CO2 in from the atmosphere and we add it to the existing five carbons in the chain and we revert that to two, three carbon molecules and then we have to change the shape. So we use the ATP and the NADPH that we made back in the light reactions to break bonds and reform new bonds so we can create a new form of this three carbon molecule that I can remove one from each time through the Kelvin cycle to make C6H12O6, our six carbon molecule called glucose. It would all be done there, except we need to revert it back to that five carbon molecule. Again, breaking and making new bonds, requiring energy or ATP. Where do we get the ATP? The light dependent reactions, light reactions, the ones we talked about in the previous slide. Okay. We have to use that energy again to get back to the beginning of the cycle. Now, if we didn't have light, this whole thing would stop because we wouldn't have ATP and NADPH to do this process for us. So that's why we need the light reactions to drive the dark reactions, also known as the light independent reactions or the Kelvin cycle. <sighs> it's not enough. It's not enough. So, this glucose, C6H12O6, is going to be used by the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the true energy producer. This makes kind of the source of the energy. Plants use cellular race, respiration just like we do. Remember I said plants breathe like we do? Remember I eliminated that misconception early, earlier in the year we talked about it? There's a reason why. This is how plants make food. Tomorrow we'll talk about how they actually utilize the food and turn it into energy. Okay? I mean, these are all, this is all energy, it's just not enough to be multicellular, okay? Does that make sense? Some bacteria, single-celled organisms, can live on that little amount of energy in the light reactions, and some do, but not very many. We definitely could not. Plants definitely could not. 